My name is John Hovanessian, and I'm a, I'm a clinician. I'm an ophthalmologist, not a nutrition scientist. Um, I do research more in, in surgical devices than anything else. I uh, have a faculty appointment at the UCLA Jules Stein Eye Institute, where I teach and, uh, and primarily in private practice at a, a group practice called Harvard Eye Associates in Southern California. We are Harvard Eye Associates, but not affiliated with uh, the Boston facility. This is a, a psychographic map of the United States and uh, shows you you know, the different areas, uh, I guess, uh, the educated folks are, and the rich are out east, and we in California on the west coast are the life of the parties, or so we're characterized. Uh, and uh, being in Southern California, uh, this would be my office staff. Uh, <laughs> I, I was pleased to say at, at the Waterford Institute, it was a very good-looking research staff. I, I, I want to congratulate you for that. Uh, and we may have some exchange with folks from Southern California, too. <laughs> Being in Southern California, where many of the companies are that, that create the technologies that we use, the, the medicines and the, and the surgical devices, uh, r this is right where I work and teach. And so I have a financial um, relationship with many of these companies uh, uh, who I work with. And, and really, of these, only Guardian Health Science, who invited me to be here for this meeting, is, uh, is in the nutrition space. Uh, I should say uh, Abbott and Bausch and also have interest in this area, but my involvement with them is less in, in nutrition. We have in the US, uh, a, as around the world, a growing aging population. And if you look at the, the, uh, this type of plot, looking at population from 1950 on the top half to, uh, to, to, to uh, 2020 in the bottom, you can see that the, horizontally we lay out the, the size of the population at each age breakdown. And what you can see is, where is there was very much a trailing off of the older population in 1950, 13 million people over age 65. Now we've got 55 million in the U.S. alone over age 65. Uh, by the year 2020. And what's more, this aging part of the population isn't what it was in, in 1950. This is a very young, very outward bound group of people. This is the founder of Patagonia, the clothing company, a man who in his 70s still loves to surf and be outdoors and do everything that he did when he was younger. The, uh, one of the most uh, unpleasant aspects of aging to the baby boomers in particular is a problem that, that I'm beginning to face and I see a lot of you in the audience are facing, and that's the need for reading glasses. What happens to all of us, as most of us know, is there's a loss of accommodation in the crystalline lens of the eye as we age. And, and as it turns out, this is a plot of diopters of, of a power of accommodation versus age. Uh, you need about twice as much accommodation uh, at, at your maximum accommodation to, to be able to read uh, as you'd need to, to read for a long period of time. So we need about three diopters of accommodation to read comfortably a, a book, let's say, in front of us. So in order to do that in a consistent way, we really need a reserve of up to six diopters of accommodation. Well, what happens as we get older, of course, is it drops off. And right around age 40 to age 50 is when we're, we cross and we're just below six diopters. This is the writing on the wall for all of us where our problem is only getting worse. And so a lot of our technology in treating older people has evolved around presbyopia, this loss of reading vision. I'm going to show you, by way of perspective, as a non-nutrition scientist, how important this is to us in treating patients, and then tie it in as we proceed to what the work that, that you are doing that's being presented here at this meeting today. So in the US alone, uh, premium IOLs are intraocular lens implants designed to correct presbyopia or to give people after cataract surgery some ability to read as well as to, to see distance uh, without corrective lenses. And their growth has been remarkable over time. Um, since their real introduction, about 2005, when they became approved by our national health care system, they have grown and grown and grown. And this is not surprising. And the technologies have gotten better because people demand this. Um, in the US, it is, as in other parts of the world, uh, uh, aging is the hope is that aging will be optional. I don't know if you can all read this. This is from, uh, in Boca Raton, a, a municipal day of prayer and thanksgiving because Botox turned 10 years old. Uh, and the products that we uh, provide to patients that help fight aging are increasingly popular. And uh, here's an example in the lens implant uh, world. This is a not yet approved in the US, but it is approved in Europe, an implant called the Synchrony IOL. It's an, a silicone lens implant. Um, made by Abbott Medical Optics um, that has two different optics, two different elements. And the front uh, plus powered uh, or converging lens uh, 
combines with a minus powered or diverging lens in the back. And this goes inside the lens capsule after cataract extraction. And with ciliary body contraction, there's a, a loosening of tension on the uh, lens zonules, which allows the front optic to prolapse forward, increasing the focusing power of the lens and bringing near objects into clear focus. And so with this simple device inside the eye, uh, many people who uh, have good clear distance vision can also focus for very nice clear small print at near. And so this is an exciting development. This is one of many accommodating implants of this sort. Here's another example of a, an exciting technology that we are now doing FDA studies on. It's called a light adjustable lens. And this is a silicone lens. And to look at it, it looks like most any other intraocular lens implant, if you've seen these very much. And what's different about it is it's made of a silicone material that is uh, designed to be light sensitive. There's a macromer inside this material itself. And so after it's implanted in the eye, we can adjust its power. And here's how we do it. We put it inside the lens capsule, allow it to heal for a week or two while the patient wears some protective glasses that prevent excessive ultraviolet light from entering the eye. And then we treat with uh, photopolymerization. We use an adjustment beam, a device that's not laser, it's not coherent light, it's, it's simply ordinary light that's very well focused that uh, is shown on the lens in a pattern that will allow us to cause polymerization in focal areas of the lens. In this case, we're causing a central steepening of the lens because of the diffusion of the macromers inside the lens material. And this is increasing the lens's power. So if we had an eye that was too hyperopic or too far-sighted after correction, we could make it more correct, more nearsighted or more neutralized. And then finally, once we have a power that we're satisfied with, and we can do this adjustment more than once, we use a lock-in beam which uh, irradiates the whole lens with visible light and then causes uh, all of the, the macromers to polymerize. And so we lock in that shape forever. With this technology, we've been able to achieve patients uh, in, in one study in Germany, 98% of patients were achieving 2015 vision all within a quarter diopter of their intended target refraction. So these are numbers that we don't see in any other cataract surgery study. So to us, to our patients, having precise focus is essential. Um, of course, there are economic factors at play here, and not every patient can afford this. There's a, a high degree of, of uh, uh, healthy skepticism from patients, as there should be, and this is true for nutritional products as well. Uh, for many of our patients, they opt out. But what we've found in our practice where the majority of patients are opting for these kinds of upgraded lenses, and by the way, what do they cost? Per eye, the cost for one of these upgraded lenses, which is not covered by uh, our national health care system, Medicare, uh, the cost is around three to $4,000 per eye. So a patient is outlaying U.S. dollars, uh, four to eight thousand, let's say six to $8,000 for both eyes to be treated. So what we found, though, is that by taking care with each patient to customize our treatment, to give them the, re the result they want, there is very much a feedback loop. There is a, uh, a, a tendency for patients to tell other patients. And we're now at a point, uh, almost 10 years into this, where patients are coming to us insisting on having these better technologies. Because they're educated, they've heard from others, that what they've received has worked well for them. I think this very same concept is essential for nutraceuticals, for any type of nutritional product that we provide. It has to work, it has to provide a perceptible benefit to the patient and a measurable result. Because for us, in treating patients surgically, macular health is really the elephant in the room. Here we are grappling with adjustments over a quarter diopter in our correction to get patients just focused just so. And yet, as we learned from a, a beautiful uh, array of studies this morning, visual performance may be profoundly influenced by what's happening in the macula. And we're not ignoring it. It's just that we haven't had a good level of comfort with what's available. Of course, uh, about a third of our patients coming to cataract surgery have some degree of maculopathy, however mild. Maybe it's not even maculopathy by that name. Maybe it's just a deficiency of macular pigment that's compromising their visual functioning. But they have something. And of course, an industry has grown enormous around this, uh, this need for nutritional therapies. Uh, $60 billion it's estimated to be in just a few years' time. So why is it that physicians are not uh, embracing this? Why is it that physicians are not engaged in recommending to patients these nutritional products? And we're not. By and large, uh, we are not. And I think it's largely because there's confusion. Um, 
physicians don't want to be selling. They don't want to be perceived as offering something that probably costs more that may have questionable benefit. They don't want to be a used car salesman. Well, they want to, to assume a role that is more the traditional doctor-patient relationship. Physicians in the US and, and everywhere in the world, I think, want to do right by their patients. They don't mind if a product is superior uh, recommending it, and they don't mind making some profit from that even if that's, if that's uh, possible. But what they're interested in primarily is an effective product that genuinely benefits the patients. Physicians and patients both know that there are a variety of different products available, some that are uh, more generally marketed for, for general health, some that are specifically focused on ocular health, uh, and some that are, uh, that are probably higher quality. But because it is such an, a confusing array of products that's available when they go to the chemist or the supermarket or the, the pharmacy where they purchase their products, uh, they'll, they'll be of one, of one of two mind frames. And one is to, to assume that paying more is better and that that's good for their eyes. The other assumption is, well, I, gee, I don't know, so I'm just going to pay the least and feel like at least I'm doing something. And probably neither of those behaviors is the ideal. Probably somewhere in the middle or something based upon uh, good science is, is our best bet. So patients are very interested in this. They are very, uh, if you look at Amazon.com, what makes it the number one shopping site in the world uh, is that there is feedback. Uh, consumers, our patients, look at what other patients say. Uh, in other words, it is evidence-based. If you're going to buy your child a rubber ducky, you want one that floats upright, <laughs> after all. So um, ARIDS-1 was so meaningful to us as clinicians because it was the first evidence that we really needed to, to start becoming engaged in making recommendations to patients, uh, that, that antioxidants played a role in preventing the progression of serious macular disease. Uh, and, of course, uh, part of that study suggested the role of lutein and zeaxanthine and that it was independently associated with a decreased likelihood of uh, neovascular events as well as more advanced forms of non-neovascular macular degeneration. And, of course, ARIDS-2, not to uh, steal the thunder from Emily Chu, our keynote speaker, uh, it additionally has shown us with, uh, with great clarity that, uh, that these micronutrients, that uh, lutein and zeaxanthine, are, are essential to, uh, to our patients in that, after all, the average Western diet contains a, a less than three milligrams of the combined uh, lutein and zeaxanthine um, you know, in, a, in a day's intake. And so we, we certainly need to think about supplementation, both in a dietary and probably in an exogenous uh, supplement. So we also know now, thanks to the work of many of you in this room, about the importance of the macular pigment optical density. And this is now, just now, becoming uh, in the forefront of, of thinking, in the uh, top of mind thinking of clinicians in the U.S. and around the world, uh, that we get better range of distance vision, better contrast, better glare tolerance, um, and photo stress recovery by having a stronger macular, uh, stronger, uh, macular pigment density. And so uh, our ability to, to put all this together is, is really essential. Now, Guardian Health Sciences has uh, been really working with uh, the folks who are really many of the most influential and uh, um, respected speakers in this room, and, and many of you are, are quite familiar with the work of the company, uh, because they've, they've put together a two-pronged approach, both to measure and to supplement. Uh, the measurement is done with a device called MapCat that Richard Bone invented and um, he spoke about yesterday. And uh, the, uh, the therapeutic arm is Lumega-Z, which is a supplement that is a, a micronized uh, lipid-based liquid that is provided and uh, to be both a complete body nutrition as well as very tolerable to patients. Uh, the MapCat, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see it. It's in the exhibit hall and you can be measured yourself. It's a, a video display that you look into and you, you uh, adjust the dial to uh, minimize the flicker and it's a, a heterochromatic uh, flicker photometer that uh, uses a macula specific protocol to uh, isolate macular as opposed to lens um, uh, effects on uh, light absorption. And so this device, is, as Richard Bone uh, elucidated a lot better than I can yesterday, uh, is designed to isolate lens uh, effective age from macular pigment optical density and, and present both of these in a non-midriatic way that is uh, simple and actually it's kind of fun to do the test. Lumega-Z, of course, uh, is a, a total body nutrition uh, supplement that is a liquid form. 
I, uh, I hear from patients all the time that the pills that they get are just too difficult to swallow. And so having a, a, a full regimen of the vitamins they would like as well as the micronutrients is very convenient to them. Uh, and so I think products like this that are designed to be uh, lipid-based, which provides uh, easier absorption uh, and delivery, as well as uh, liquid um, delivery vehicle, are going to be the way that many of these nutritionals are probably going to go just because of how simple it is. Most importantly, what, um, what physicians want is an ability to measure the result. And so the, the capacity to first start with the patient, measure mac, uh, macular pigment uh, density with a, a MAPCAT test, uh, and then present whether, whether it's worthwhile to consider nutritional supplements, and then to supplement and come back and measure again. This is the way we treat disease. This is the way we treat glaucoma. This is the way we treat diabetes, high blood pressure. Virtually every disease that can be monitored in an objective way, we measure and we treat in this way. And so why shouldn't we with macular pigment? And so uh, the ability to use these two hand in hand to compare other nutritional uh, therapies is certainly a nice advantage of this package that uh, the Guardian has put together. Uh, we not only see among our patients who have measurable diseases that we treat uh, better clinical results, but better compliance. And after all, no matter how brilliant the supplements we create are, uh, if patients won't take them, they're not going to do them as much good, are they? So, uh, you know, in, in, on the clinical science side, we often end our talks by saying, well, you know, we need more data to make a real conclusion. We need more studies on this. And I, I heard this a lot uh, at this conference as well. And this, these are appropriate words to say, but from a patient's perspective, at some point, better is the enemy of good. We need to say, look, we have a good understanding of what nutritional support patients need. We have a, a decent idea how to measure it. We need to implement this kind of treatment for our patients now before further damage is done so that we can optimize their visual performance now with the, with the best science that we have uh, in front of us. And with the information we've learned from ARIDS too, this is particularly relevant and particularly timely right now. So uh, in summary, our patients want the treatments that are the best, that are the best absorbed, that are the easiest to tolerate, but they insist that they be measurable results. Uh, that if we can provide that to them, they are very interested and physicians too will be eager to run toward this type of product that will help our patients now and into the future. So hope uh, some of you get a chance to visit us in Southern California and Laguna Beach. It's certainly been a pleasure to be part of this meeting today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. The paper is open for discussion. Other questions from the audience? John? Yes. My, my question is um, around bioavailability. Have you looked at how the response, there's a lot, when I was looking at the formulation, there's a lot in there. So I was just wondering if you've looked at, is there any uh, competition because of the amount of um, nutrients that you have in the formulation? Well, the primary outcome measure that's been looked at is the map, uh, macular pigment optical density, and we've seen very clear correlations there. And so I think with time, we'll see whether, whether some of these competitive effects uh, occur, and there may be some adjustments in the formula. Uh, we think that the, the formula, which is a 15 10 3, um, is uh, of, uh, of lutein, mesozizanthine, and, and xanthine, uh, is probably uh, quite sufficient and quite well absorbed. Uh, because of the lipid uh, delivery system that it's, uh, that it's in. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any competition. And the clinical results, you know, much of this is anecdotal at this point, but the re reports we're hearing from patients about improvements in their visual performance are, are quite promising. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I, I believe I can, I can help you out by, by answering that question because we, we, we did uh, a short, uh, small, small number uh, study, and in fact, we, we really didn't see any appreciable change in, in beta carotene, uh, uh, beta cryptoxanth, and, and, and the other carotenoids. So uh, I think that the carotenoid levels are, are at a, a point where uh, they're not going to be competing out normal absorption. Thank you, John. Any further questions? John, of your colleagues, how many of them are actively um, uh, suggesting or recommending nutritional supplements, whatever the, 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 mark, the makeup of those are? How many of my colleagues are suggesting nutritional supplements? I would say most are recommending nutritional supplements, but many are not recommending a particular product, which is really not serving the patient that well because 
you saw how many options they have at the, uh, at the store. So uh, it, it is really probably considered in most of the world malpractice not to recommend nutritional supplements to patients with maculopathy, with age-related maculopathy based on what we know. It is science. It's needed. But uh, we, it really is the lack of, of good measurable results that, uh, that, that holds most of us back. Do you think it will take a legal case for that to change? That's a great question. In the U.S., we love legal cases, don't we? And it, it certainly does uh, move things forward sometimes. My hope is that educational events like this, uh, where all of you can help educate my colleagues as to the importance of this, as to the work that you're doing, it's so vital for, for my colleagues to understand. And I think furthermore, not just the, you know, we're, we're also a world that lives on, on short-term uh, goals, don't we? And so knowing that uh, within just a few months of nutritional supplementation, you can increase visual performance, I think that's a powerful motivator to our patients. They're all interested in avoiding cataract formation or at least reducing its impact on their vision. So we have the ability to influence physicians who have the ability to influence their patients if we, if we use that ability. It's a great question. So any more questions? Okay. Uh, you have used a lipid-based uh, supplement, actually. Which lipid you have used as a supplement, like phospholipid or a basic oil or canola oil or olive oil or any other oil? Which I'm, lipid source you have used? I'm, I'm going to ask John to probably elaborate more, more of the reasoning for what was done. You want to? Can you answer that, John Lander? Uh, the, the, it's a vegetable oil <laughs> base. Uh, so uh, it, it's just micronized to uh, enhance solubility and then emulsified in, in an aqueous uh, uh, buildup so that it, it, it's easily palatable. It can carry good flavors as well. So that it's easy to take. Uh, you know, and, and I, I don't have the answer to that in front of me. I, I, we can find out for you and let you know. John, uh, okay. I, I think uh, I, I'm not sure the exact value, but it's around seventy dollars uh, for four weeks. I think so. It, so it's a little bit on the high end in terms of the comparable uh, costs. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we move on to our next speaker.